All right, good morning, everybody. It is still morning. Uh, and welcome to uh, the seventh annual NOAA HABS forecast that's hosted at Ohio State University Stone Laboratory. Webinar's running right now. We'll have some audio for the speakers up here. If questions come from the audience, we do have a microphone that we'll try and move around for folks to talk on. Um, everybody that's on the webinar, there's about 450 folks that have logged on um, virtually to listen today. They're all on mute, um, but they will have a chat function to ask questions via the chat function. If you're in the room, again, internet access is up on the board, as are any social media uh, links. And so my name is Dr. Chris Winslow. I'm the director for Ohio Sea Grant and Ohio State University Stone Laboratory. Um, in that role, I, I report at a university level. I'm in the Office of Research at Ohio State University, but I also reside within the College of Food and, Agri and uh, Environmental Sciences. For those of you that don't know, that college uh, contains the Land Grant Extension Program. And so as a, as a uh, Sea Grant program and a Stone Lab program, we tap into the research education and outreach associated with that college. In the room today, we have about 25 different media outlets. Uh, we have uh, roughly 10 elected officials or, or some of their aides. We have 25-ish content experts in a PowerPoint presentation I will give uh, later um, in this event. I will introduce many of those people sitting at the, in the audience. When I talk about the work they're doing, I will have them stand and, and wave because some of the elected officials or the media folks may want to talk to them about the work um, that they're doing. And then we have about 10 agency folks in the room. Um, so with National Weather Service, no individuals. And so that's what's uh, going on today. All right, apparently I've got to hold this guy up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before I introduce the, the NOAA leadership, so we have um, the Assistant Administrator for uh, NOAA, Dr. Russell Callender. I want to give the federal and state uh, elected officials or their uh, aides a, a second to stand up and just say who they are and, and, and anything that they want to have. So we're looking for a few uh, quick words at the beginning. Um, so from our federal side, uh, we have Kelsey Krull here today that's representing um, Senator Portman. All right, next we have actually, we also have Jane Rubelow coming from uh, uh, Congresswoman Kaptur's office. Hi, um, I was going to have each of my six interns speak, but I guess not. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank Chris and I want to thank uh, Noah, um, Dr. Stump, for inviting us again and for the good work you're doing on behalf of the lake. Thank you. Um, Ann Longsworth Orr coming from Senator Brown's office. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks to Noah and Sea Grant Stone Lab for for inviting us today and for the good work you do year round for what we hear. Thank you. We have David Wirt representing us, uh, uh, Representative Lada's office. Hi, David Wirt, uh, Congressman Lada's uh, district director here in the Bowling Green office. Uh, again, uh, very familiar with the, uh, the uh, issues that have been coming up. Uh, good to be here again this year for the uh, for HAB forecast and meet up with NOAA folks again. Thank you. Thank you, David. And from the state side, we have Representative Sheehy that's in the, in the audience also. Representative Sheehy over here. Mike Sheehy and I represent Thank you, Representative Sheehy. We also have Rep Representative Hoops in the, in the, in the back there. Uh, Jim Hoops, I represent the 81st House District that encompasses Williams, Henry, uh, Putnam, and a little bit of Fulton County. Glad to be here today. I represent an agricultural area. Um, and they, they, too, are very concerned about what's happening here, and they're doing a lot of good things. And I appreciate the, the work that you're doing through the scientific way of doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, Representative Arndt in the room also in the back. I represent the 89th district, which is uh, all of Erie and Ottawa County. So you're actually standing, sitting in my district. And uh, it's always a pleasure for me to be able to come over and look at the collaboration with all the individuals that have bring forth so much great information. I want to do sort of a shout out for uh, Chris Winslow, as well as a number of others that are here. Uh, uh, Dr. Reuters sitting here as well, and, I, and I'm going to miss a few. But anyhow, uh, it was kind of interesting when we had nine scientists came together and agreed on 
a white paper that was published uh, September uh, in 2017. And the Senator Gardner and I were able to utilize that white paper. And we have nine scientists agreeing on a strategy of what the challenges are within the, uh, the watersheds. Uh, it was a blueprint for our Clean Lake 2020. And I'm pleased to announce that the Clean Lake 2020 was signed yesterday by the governor. And uh, Stone Lab will receive about $2.65 million for additional uh, uh, lab uh, space, as well as some in-lake monitoring and in-stream monitoring. We could not have come up with a piece of legislation that was more focused and direct to be actually able to address the algal blooms had it not been for the work of the scientists. So again, obviously, we see just what's going on in the room with some of the expertise, but understand it's both a state and a federal partnership, and so we need everybody at the table. So I'm very thankful for all the work that you've done. And with my colleagues here, uh, I want to thank all of them for support because that particular legislation passed unanimous in both the House and the Senate with not one dissenting vote. So thank you very much for all the work. Thank you, Representative Art. Also here we have some aides from uh, Representative Carfagna's office. So Abe, Jacob, Abe, you're on. Thank you. And then we have Will Hinman from uh, Representative Cup's office, too. Hi, Will Hinman from Representative Bob Cup's office in Allen County. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to learning about the presentation today. Great. And, and the last individual, uh, Senator Gardner, sent along a, a letter that he'd asked me to read here before I turn it over to Dr. Callender. So this is from um, Senator Randy Gardner. Kind of echoes what uh, Representative Arndt says. says, thank you for your leadership and innovation to provide brief statement today. I was pleased to sponsor together with Representative Arndt the Clean Lake 2020 plan. While this is not the last, the last word on uh, striving to help Lake Erie, it is an important step for 2018 and beyond that the science tells us can make a difference. Included in Senate Bill 299, of course, is the $2.65 million for Ohio State University lab improvements and to enhance the lab capacity and lake monitoring. If it wasn't for the quality of work we know you do, that investment would not have been included in the Clean Lake 2020. My appreciation to everyone uh, at the forecast who will continue to stand with us toward a cleaner lake in the years to come. So Senator Gardner, um, Senate Majority Leader. So with that, I, I want to turn it over to um, Dr. Russell Callender, again, um, Assistant Administrator for NOAA, um, for his work, and he's going to introduce some of his, his staff. Thanks, Chris. So thanks, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, as, as you said, I'm Russell Callender. I'm the Assistant Administrator of NOAA's National Ocean Service. That's just a fancy title to say I'm the Director of NOAA's Ocean Service. That's one of the five uh, major line offices uh, of NOAA. My organization focuses on helping Great Lakes and coastal communities prepare for, respond to, and recover from coastal hazards, including harmful algal blooms, or HABs, which is what we're really all here to talk about today. I'd like to thank Ohio Sea Grant and the Stone Laboratory at The Ohio State University for hosting us at their beautiful facility on Lake Erie. And I really look forward to our time out on the lake today uh, with the water sampling cruises that are planned for later this afternoon. Senators Portman and Brown and Representatives Kaptur and Joyce, along with several other members of Congress, have sponsored legislation to reauthorize the Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research and Control Act. That's a mouthful. This act helps support NOAA and our partners' efforts to understand, monitor, and predict harmful algal plumes. I want to extend my sincere appreciation for the state representatives, congressional staff, state representative staff, members who are here today, and really looking forward to our conversations with you as well. We know that harmful algal blooms are important to Congress. Um, in its report for the fiscal year 2019 budget, the Senate communicated that it recognizes the importance of the Great Lakes integrated assessment and action strategy for harmful algal bloom prediction, control, and mitigation in the Great Lakes region. Harmful algal blooms are important to my organization, to NOAA as well. We're especially grateful to our partners, many of whom are here today, who help us work on harmful algal blooms in this region. In a few minutes, my colleagues from NOAA and Ohio Sea Grant will give you the details the 2018 Lake Erie Harmful Algal Bloom Seasonal Forecast. This forecast gives coastal managers, lake users, and drinking water facility operators a general sense 
of the potential severity of the upcoming bloom season. We all know how important it is to prepare and keep people safe and our economy moving forward. The blue economy, as we call it, is a priority for NOAA. There are resources and services that the ocean and Great Lakes provide that drive our economy. Our approach in NOAA to the blue economy is to promote key areas, including things like maritime commerce, enhancing seafood competitiveness, ocean mapping, coastal risk reduction, and recreation and tourism. As you likely know, and if you don't know, you're going to learn about, the blue-green algae microcystis that forms in Lake Erie can directly impact recreation and tourism. It can be a severe nuisance for charter and recreational boaters and fishers. This algae produces neurotoxins and liver toxins that can contaminate drinking water and harm swimmers and pets in areas where these toxins concentrate. As part of NOAA's Blue Economy Initiative, we will continue to develop early warning systems for harmful algal blooms to enable the public to make better informed decisions about recreational activities and to keep people safe. You likely remember the massive algal bloom in Western Lake Erie in 2014, where Toledo officials issued a two-day ban on drinking or cooking uh, using tap water for more than 400,000 residents because of high levels of toxins. One study funded by the International Joint Commission showed that the event resulted in about a $65 million economic loss for the region. The same study also showed that if this type of harmful algal bloom event occurred each year for 30 years, it would cost Lake Erie communities an estimated 1.3 billion, that's with a B, 1.3 billion in terms of loss of tourism and recreation dollars and even property value, plus the additional expenses for treating drinking water. Another study showed that state fishing license sales drop at least 10% every time a bloom reaches a moderate level of health risk. In a summer-long bloom, that's an estimated 5.6 million in lost fishing revenue for anglers. There is some good news. It's not all, uh, not all scary bad news. I think the flip side is that these blooms are not always toxic, they're not always severe, and they don't impact every beach on the lake. And our tools can help coastal communities and coastal residents plan. There can be safe places to fish and enjoy the lake even during a bloom, which is why it's important for people to check for information advisories every day, much like you would check the weather before going out to a beach. Our state partners offer that safety information online. So that's why NOAA and our partners stay busy with the Lake Erie harmful algal blooms. And we're not only providing seasonal forecasts that you're going to hear about today, but alongside our partners, we're also monitoring conditions constantly, issuing regular forecasts when blooms are present, and working on improving these forecasts and turning research products into more operational products that can provide you information on a more routine basis. NOAA issues twice weekly bulletins when bloom conditions start, containing three to five day forecasts. And actually we already started issuing those uh, bulletins in late June and you can sign up to get those forecast bulletins through email. Uh, if you don't know where to find that out, find me, find Chris, we can certainly help you out with that. NOAA's partners at Ohio EPA, Ohio Sea Grant, and the Great Lakes Observing System help make the bulletin possible. Our forecasts are better, uh, better now because this year we're using the European Space Agency's Sentinel-3 satellite to detect cyanobacteria. This satellite provides a higher resolution view to allow water treatment facilities and public safety managers to make decisions at a more local scale where water intakes and swimming beaches would be. I mentioned moving from a research to an operational usage. NOAA, through our uh, key partner, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, also has a harmful algal bloom tracker that provides a 10-day outlook of bloom trajectory, where the blooms are going, and concentrations using ex an experimental 3D model. That's kind of a mouthful. This model allows for us to more accurately forecast a bloom along the shoreline and identify where a bloom is in the water column. That's the three-dimensional part. This matters because blooms at the surface are more likely to impact fishers or swimmers, whereas blooms that extend deeper into the water column are gonna more likely to impact water intake valves. So it's great to have that three-dimensional view. We're working on transitioning this model to include in our regular forecast capabilities. Many other state agencies and academic and industry partners work on HABs and contribute to our forecasts. 
The critical nutrient data for the forecast is provided by our colleagues from Heidelberg University, including Laura Johnson, who will speak momentarily. In addition, many other partners help run the forecasts, including the University of Michigan, Limnotech, Stanford University, Carnegie Institution for Science, and North Carolina State University. Field observations from monitoring and modeling are done in partnership with Ohio uh, Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory at Ohio State University, University of Toledo, Bowling Green State University, and Ohio EPA. I'd like to mention, uh, as I close here, another important partner that's gathering field data about harmful algal blooms. Since 2013, Ohio Sea Grant and the Stone Lab have partnered with Ohio EPA to train fishing charter boat captains to collect water samples. Every Monday throughout the summer, these captains collect samples and turn them over to Stone Lab for analysis to look for toxins, the biomass of the algae, and the nutrient concentrations. The captains also talk with and educate their clients about blooms in Lake Erie. This is exactly the type of innovative partnership that can help keep the public safe and support local economies. I also think this is a fantastic example of the value of Sea Grant extension and engagement. Uh, I want to mention a few folks in the room that are key. I just mentioned Sea Grant. Jonathan Pinnock, the director of the National Sea Grant Program, is here. Uh, also, Steve Thur, the director of the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, part of the Ocean Service provide some of the key science and support for that science is here. And Rick Stumpf on my team, who you're going to hear about as well. So with that, I'm probably over time, and I'm going to pass it back to Chris, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you, everybody. If we could give a round of applause for uh, Dr. Callender. So we'll transition now to uh, the loading data. So we're going to bring up Dr. Laura Johnson, who is the director for the National Center for Water Quality Research at, at Heidelberg University. So Laura, take it away. You've been practicing that acronym. <laughs> all right. OK, hi, everyone. Good to see you all today. I see a lot of familiar faces, so that's really great. All right. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you guys about what we've been seeing so far this spring. So let's just jump right in. Uh, for those of you who don't know where Heidelberg is located, I like to put the little map up there closer. Okay, I figured you were there to yell at me. <laughs> okay. Oh, this one. Oh. Do I just click? Or is there a clicker? Okay. Which one did you do? Oh, just space one. Okay, that worked. All right, so before we get into any of the data, I want a quick review of our tributary loading program. This is basically our water quality program. Uh, you see this map here, each little colored uh, watershed you can see there. The red uh, dots are all of the places where we are currently collecting water samples. So if you counted them all up, you would count 23 stations, which is an awful lot of water samples collected every year. For the Maumee River, we collect samples at Waterville, um, Ohio. Uh, and samples are collected three times a day, all year round, and we retrieve them every week for analysis in the lab. So we began sampling in the Maumee River in 1974, and when I say we've been collecting samples year round, three times a day, all the time, that means we started sampling in 1974 for the Maumee River, we never stopped. There's no, you know, uh, did you just start sampling for this season yet or not? It's like, well, no, we started, it was a long time ago though. Um, although we are collecting water samples at each of these locations. USGS is the, the group that p provides all the flow information, so we couldn't do all of this work without them, so we gotta put a shout out for USGS. Okay, and although we collect an awful lot of data, and we look at various forms of nutrients as well as sediment, all I'm gonna talk to you about today is phosphorus. Okay, um, and I'll talk to you about various forms of phosphorus, I like to show this picture. Those of you who've seen me give a talk have seen this picture many times. Um, and essentially we have total phosphorus, which is that muddy water sample. It's got the phosphorus that's in the water and dissolved, as well as that which is associated with the sediment. You can filter out the particulates, and then what makes it through the filter is dissolved. We also are gonna show you some uh, data on total bioavailable phosphorus, both me and Rick, which is why I said we, not a royal we. Um, and total bioavailable phosphorus, essentially that phosphorus that's available for the algae or microcystis that is growing, 
and that doesn't settle out between Waterville and the lake. What it means functionally is it's all the dissolved phosphorus and about 8% of the particulate. Okay, and then before I even start to get into all the terminology, I'm just gonna do a quick translation here. This is also becoming my coffee slide, right, so that uh, you guys know what I'm saying and I'll use it later to help translate what I'm saying as well. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some data and also it looks like all my animations are gone, so I apologize. Anything that's supposed to pop up is not popping up. You might get a lot more info than you're supposed to at once. Okay, so. Um, so what we have here is uh, loads. The loads are essentially the mass of whatever nutrient. This is going to be phosphorus over some amount of time. Usually we're talking about metric tons per year, but since I'm talking about the springtime loading season, it's metric tons per spring. To calculate load, you essentially multiply a concentration by a flow or discharge. A concentration is the mass of that phosphorus per volume of water. Uh, the flow or discharge is just how much water you have over some amount of time. And so the examples here are milligrams per liter and cubic feet per second. So my example here is showing that you could have a small cup of coffee, right, and you put a packet of sugar in there, and that's a fairly concentrated sweetness, a concentrated amount of sugar, milligrams of sugar per liter of coffee. If you're drinking a whole liter, you might need to consider cutting back maybe a little. Um, but let's say you're really tired in the morning and you accidentally, instead of putting your packet of sugar in your coffee, you put it in your whole pot right, then that would be not very concentrated. You wouldn't even be able to taste the sugar, most likely. However, since you're so sleepy, instead of drinking a cup of coffee like I did, you drank the whole pot of coffee, both of us would have consumed the same amount of sugar, one packet, right? So it would be the same loading of sugar. So what does this have to do with rivers? Well, we can have from one year to the next the scenario where because of changes in concentration or flow, we might have similar or different loadings. Or if we compare across rivers, we can have a very big river with a low concentration that has the same loading as a smaller river with a much higher concentration. So all of these are interrelated and important to understand. So what happened this year? So this is just showing the flow. This is just water, not talking about what's in the water, going from the beginning of February through as far as we've got. Of course, you can see the empty bit going to uh, the end of July, which is what we usually consider for our, our loading season. And I put a line here because, you know, in February, at the very end of February, going into March, we got a lot of high flow events. We had a, a good amount of rain and some thaw. And so you can see there's some high flow events, but then we really only captured one of them once we got into March. Now, it seems like we had, oh my goodness, so it's such a wet spring, right? Well, not really. <laughs> you know, where it rained, it was very patchy and a lot of periods of time where it got very warm and dry in between rain events. So we ended up sort of ho oh, mediocre, somewhere in the middle for, for flows, right? So these storm events, there's about, um, I think I counted up seven of them throughout this period of time, but they're not all that, all that crazy. Um, if we pop in total bioavailable phosphorus, what you see is that the concentrations do exactly what you would expect phosphorus to do if it's coming from a non-point source, which is land runoff. So concentrations are very low when there's not very much flow. When we get a storm event, the concentrations go up, and when the storm event's over, it goes back down. So we have low concentrations at low flow and high concentrations at high flow. What's interesting about this, which if you've seen me talk about before, is that the concentrations don't vary a whole lot based off of the extent or the magnitude of the storm. They basically always go up to about 0.15 and it comes back down, except for there's a little bit of weirdness in the middle of May, which is probably around when uh, pop-up fertilizer was being used and some of the ground working was happening. So I think that's being driven a little bit more by particulates than by dissolved. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, this is the plot that we put out with the bulletin showing the cumulative total bioavailable phosphorus load. So basically you take that concentration, remember, you multiply it by flow, you get a load for each day, and we add it up over this period of time starting March 1st all the way through August, and we see how it accumulates. So the red here is showing 2018. You can see in 2018 we had a little bit of flow in March. Some rains in April, lines up really nicely with our hydrograph here. Um, and then uh, some events in late June, almost July. The lighter color is where we are projecting that we're gonna get to. So you can see we're expecting a little bit of an increase, but nothing huge. 
And then what I'm also showing here is the maximum and minimum. So the maximum cumulative loads and the minimum. Basically, the maximum is 2011 and 2015 combined. The minimum is 2012. But I do have, oops, keep trying to hit arrows instead of spacebar. Uh, and so we do have here also, you can see the lines for 2016 and 2017. Um, how they played out a little bit differently early on, but essentially we're straddling the both of them. It's right in between the two. If we looked at a median or an average loading, we'd be kind of right there in the middle of it all. This is also a uh, bar chart I usually show, so it shows how much loading we have so far. So you can see this is as of July 5th, and you can compare it to past year. So we've exceeded 2012, 2016, 2014. Or, or sorry, 2004, but we're not as high as 2014, 2008, and these other scary years, right? 2015 was way higher than where we are now. We're projected to get up to about um, 343 metric tons um, by July 31st. Oh, and I should have mentioned our projections are based off of the projected flows that we get from the Ohio, uh, well, basically National Weather Service, Ohio River Forecast Center. So they forecast what the flows are gonna be based off of weather forecasts, and we can use that to project what the loads will be. So how does this compare to past years? So I've done something a little different here. I've taken our years, and I've averaged them in five-year increments. So you can see the first one, basically, we started in 1975, and it's average of 75 through 79. I put the other years on the bottom here, but you can see how they kind of line up in the middle. And so what you see is that flows, they vary a bit, right, kind of gone up and down, but no real strong trend until the past decade where we've seen a, a striking increase. Now, there's still a lot of variation within those five-year increments because we know we've gone from really high years to drought years multiple times in this period, but it really shows how that increase in flow has occurred. For 2018, the hash mark is where we are currently, and then the whole bar is where we're projecting to be. Uh, for flow, you can see we're at 3.1 cubic kilometers, maybe go up to 3.3. So a little bit lower than what we've seen as an average for the past five years, but well within what we've seen as normal. So I did the same thing for all of our phosphorus, right? Uh, so we've got total phosphorus here. You can see the loadings kind of mirror discharge. We have higher loadings in the earlier period than discharge and it goes down and then we see that same increase for uh, the dash line here is our target. So you can see that, you know, we're in 2018 above the target. We expect a little bump up to the end of July, but, um, you know, nothing too crazy there. What's interesting is if we look at our flow weight and mean concentrations, so remember this is the other part of loading is concentration, right? You can see concentration was high it came down into, and since, you know, about 2005, there's been a little variation, but we've been pretty static in terms of concentration. A little bit different than what we see with loading for total phosphorus, right? So we know that that increase in loading is being driven by flow, that increase in flow. Uh, we are above the target. We're currently at 0.37 milligrams per liter for our concentration, which is a bit higher than our 0.23 target, I would say. Um, is that everything I wanted to say on this slide? I think so. Same thing for dissolved phosphorus. People think about this a lot too. Um, and you can see dissolved phosphorus is showing that U-shaped curve that we always show that's both for loadings as well as flow weight amine. I do think I have a thing here. You can't really see it very well. But you can see that we had high loads. We went down to below or at the target in the 90s and early 80s. And then you can see this increase in dissolved phosphorus loading to the lake since the mid-90s. Uh, 2018, again, we're a little bit lower than what we've seen as an average over the past five years, but well within the range of error and still over the target of 186 metric tons. We think, you know, we're at 230, we might bump up to about 270 at most. Um, and then finally, we have flow weight and means. You can see we're very high of flow weight and means at the target in the mid-90s. And now we basically have returned to where we were. Um, this year, we're at 0 0.075, which is technically a little bit lower than our average of 0 0.09 over the past five years, still above that target. But the question then that you should be thinking right now is, well, 0 0.075, is this progress? Are we getting somewhere? Is this the beginning of, of, of change? And so I want to show you guys some figures to think about that. Now, I apologize. We're going to miss the animation, so I'm going to have to... Listen to what I say, as I pointed out, and then put it all together, right? Okay, so, so I've, I just spent a lot of time telling you that 
loading is being driven a lot by flow or discharge, right? Same two things. Now remember, loading is how many sugar packets we consumed, where discharge is how many pots of coffee you drink. Okay, so we were talking about these two things. And what you first see here is that they're really highly correlated. Look at this line. These dots are not varying from this line very much at all. Okay? So this is 2000 through 2017. The yellow dot here is 2018, which is right on the line, which unfortunately means that flow rate and mean are, and the loading is exactly where we would expect it to be for this amount of discharge. Right? So what it also tells you, which you'd have to really dig into the data to see, is that flow rate and mean does change a little bit with flow. If you get to very low flows, we start to see it come down. So what I did here was I put in some shaded areas. We've got this blue area, which is the loading target, right, 186 metric tons. You can see that we've met that loading target before when it's very dry. And then this triangle here is the flow rate and mean target that we want to get to. So really the cross between these two is the, the sweet spot. That's where we really want our data to be. But we understand that once we get above this point here where they cross, which would be 2008 discharge, you know, the, it's going to be really tough to get there. So we would accept anything in here because we still have a much lower bloom than what we would have if we were way up here, okay? So the question is, have we made progress? Well, what we really want is this yellow dot to be this red dot down here. So we would hope to see that it was getting closer to this region. Might be hard to see, but once we get to that target, I think it'll be fairly clear. So this is how I've been tracking if we're looking through the season, are we actually making that progress? Are we starting to see the changes in, in terms of concentration? It really helps to put it in this perspective for me. If I also pop in total phosphorus, you can see it's almost the exact same story. It's a little bit more of a linear relationship. You can see 2018 is right on the line, um, which means that the loading is exactly where we would expect it to be, given the amount of flow that we've had, but we want it to be way down here. Okay. So what I just told you is that we haven't made a whole lot of progress, right, which is a big question. So the question that you should be thinking right now is why not? And so the first thought is, well, maybe the practices aren't working. We're putting in practices, and maybe they're just not the effective practices. Well, I would argue that that's not the case. There's a lot of effort going into practices that most folks would say are the ones that we should be focusing on. Nutrient management plans, drainage water management, um, so for our certification, don't apply on first round. These are all moving in the right direction and dealing with things that you would be thinking would control things like dissolved phosphorus. Okay, so if practices are being effective, then the two other options is that there's not enough implementation. So I have a few bullets here that show that, well, goodness, there's been an awful lot of implementation. However, I would argue that of the practices we need, we probably need a little bit more, right? Um, and there's a lot of effort right now, if you've been paying attention to the news, to get that little bit more, okay? And then also the other question, which is really important, is has there been enough time to tell if these practices are doing their thing? And I would truly argue that that is not the case. We're talking about something that took, I showed, what, 15 years to get to, you know, where we got up high again. So to think that after a couple of years or a few years of implementation, we're really focusing on this bioavailable or dissolved phosphorus issue, um, and we're just starting to sort of get that uptick and all the implementation, that I would argue that we just haven't had enough time and people need to be patient, and we wouldn't expect to see these changes that quickly. So with that, I will mention that if you wanted to play with this data yourself, you want to compare it to different years, We've got it all up on the, the uh, Maumee River tracker on Gloss, so you can go check that out there. And then here's all of my information and where you can find even more info, and I swear I go on the rivers. So I had to show evidence of that. Okay. Thank you, Laura. With that loading information in your, in your brains, we're going to turn it over to Steve Thur, who's going to introduce uh, Rick Stump to give the actual forecast based on those uh, loading data. So, Steve. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Steve Thur. I'm the director of NCOS, the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Within NOAA, we either conduct or fund about 80% of the agency's work on harmful algal blooms and hypoxia. I have the, the pleasure of getting to work with Dr. Rick Stump. Uh, he gets to do what I consider the fun stuff, while I get to do a lot of the bureaucratic um, requirements uh, necessary so that we can conduct our research. 
Rick is a research oceanographer with our organization. He is a senior specialist in using remote sensing technologies to address environmental problems along our coasts, and he's the one that's going to be um, sharing with you our projection for this season. Rick. Thank you, Steve, um, and Russell, for your great introduction to um, everything going on, and Chris, Chris Winslow for, um, for hosting this. And by the way, uh, Jeff Reuter is in the room. You, everyone knows Jeff, but uh, wave your hand anyway. This is the seventh year we have done this, and Jeff got this started in 2012. And as you recall, the 2011 was the worst bloom Lake Erie had ever seen, and so being able to create a forecast after that bloom was a, a big success um, overall. So with this, the seasonal forecast, we have uh, ensemble of models developed by an uh, ensemble group here. Um, key, key to all of this is Laura Johnson's data. I can't emphasize enough that no one could model this at all if we did not have that nutrient load data. In many places, they get it once a month, once a quarter, and you can't get this kind of model out of that kind of that data. We need that daily information. So it's an extraordinary data set. Um, it, it needs to keep going. Um, the various groups, uh, long list, um, University of Michigan, I can't try to read all the names, um, NC State University, Lumno Tech, uh, Stanford and Carnegie Institution, and of course support by others. Um, a couple of people are in the room. Uh, Nate Manning's here um, as well. John Bratton is here also. I think those, yeah, I think those are all the people who are definitely in the room. Okay, so said the space bar. All right, I'd like to at least touch on last year where it was and our, how our forecast did. We, of course, know there was, a, there was a bad bloom last year and there was scum in downtown Toledo in mid September, and it did go from Toledo all the way over to Ontario at that time, that, that scum layer. Um, the forecast last year, probably a big question is did we get that right? And yes, we, we forecast the seven with an uncertainty between um, uh, uh, six and um, about eight and a half, and we were, it was, we were slightly under for the exact number. But yes, we correctly predicted a bloom of about that severity. So the forecast was right. Um, of all the forecasts, um, I would say the only, we've been, we've been correct in all years, to, except maybe 2016, we estimated a larger bloom than actually occurred in 2016. And that would be the only exception for, for the forecast overall. So that is what 20, 2017 looked like. And, um, and just to give a context, this is uh, for the, uh, the years we have now, 16 years of data from satellite, and this is the maximum extent each year. You can see the major bloom years of um, 2011, 13, 15, and 17. Um, I'm sure it's a coincidence those are all odd-numbered years. Um, interesting question uh, uh, thing there. Um, and of course, 2016 was relatively mild and 2012 was uh, mild. 2014 was um, quite toxic and that was part of the issue. It was not a, is not a big a bloom as these other years, but it was, it was a substantial bloom, but extremely toxic when it started and that was part of the problem. In fact, it's, of the last five years, it's the most toxic, the, the cells were producing more toxin individually at the beginning of 2014 than any of the other years that we've measured. That was part of what, what had happened then. That's a whole other conversation. I'm not going to go into that more here. Um, so the ensemble models, I am not going to go through this whole slide. I'm putting this in for completeness. I'm sure if anyone's interested in the details, but we have, we have different types of models, um, a statistical approach, process model, uh, mechanistic model. And that's very important on doing an ensemble that you have different different types of models, different inputs, different methods, because you are most likely to bracket the actual event if you have different types of models. You use the same model and you just tune it slightly differently, you end up with the same model. And if it's, under, if it's biased, you end up with the wrong result. So the fact that we have this combination is very important to, to making sure we, we actually, our models bracket what will actually happen this year. So again, I'm not gonna go through all of this. Um, uh, you've seen this from Laura, of course the loads are critical, spring load is a key part for most of the models in one way or the other, either in a daily form for a process model like the Limnotech one or in a bulk where it's the cumulative load for the whole spring. 
as well. Uh, 299 so far. It's going to be slightly higher. And by the way, with the um, the, the forecast for the July, people had asked the question. Um, the overall weather systems are calm weather for July. So there's there's now a system set up to be stable. So we're not expecting at all any sign of, of rainfall events. Much different from June. I could tell you in early June that the overall was unstable weather. And you saw there were a number of very strong storms. So we're not expecting any significant change in, in the loads the rest of this month. Okay, this is why we're here. <laughs> forecast for this year, we are the ensemble, we expect the forecast of, of severity of six. That puts it below, definitely below 2017, below last year. The uncertainty is between about a five and a 7.5 between the ensemble and models. The narrow bar is the full range of possible uncertainty that's out to 95th percentile of all the combination of models. The likely range is between five and seven and a half, and we forecast to six. Again, 2017 was an eight. I will say the models, with their differences, there are there's a bit of spread on them. You can see the, the, the small circles. Those are differences and assumptions and so forth. When we get to the end of the season, we can compare where we are with the bloom against the models, and that will actually help us inform and improve the models in the future because we'll know what to wait and what not to wait between those models overall. Um, you can see we are expecting, yes, there will be a significant bloom. That is a component of that. Um, and we have had some other years that look somewhat similar to that. Those who remember 8, 9, and 10, there were areas of noticeable scum in the lake. But this is much smaller than what we have seen last year. Um, just to put in context between 16 and 17, because those are the recent memory, we're smaller than 17, but definitely larger than 16. And 16, where I think most people think of, was pretty mild, benign year. There was still, there were some areas of some issues, and you can see patches of those. Um, in this case, at this particular time, is closer to the Michigan shore, which anyone from Ohio would be happy about. People from Michigan wouldn't. Um, there's a whole interesting side to that. Um, but that kind of gets you, we're between those two. An important thing I'd like to say, how many people here were involved with the, um, the Battle of Lake Erie commemorative in 2013? Um, you had a great time, didn't you? There was a really bad bloom that year. You weren't out, there was no scum out there. Yeah, great time, everyone had a great time. You can have a good time in Lake Erie. <laughs> I can't emphasize that enough, there are plenty of places we are monitoring the bulletin twice a week. You'll know where the bloom is. We'll also report out the estimated mixing. The analysis talks about mixing. For any boater, that, that mixing is important. If we're saying high mixing, assuming it's not 30 knot winds, um, well, you won't go out. But if we say there's mixing, it's unlikely to see scones. So it's important to actually look for that information as well. Um, another part is conditions vary. The winds move these blooms around. I'm just showing here an example, two similar blooms. And this is the area around Port Clinton and a bit above it, 28, 2008. It was there, 2010 it wasn't. And an overall issue that gets very interesting, if we have southerly winds, it becomes an Ontario problem. If we have northerly winds, it becomes an Ohio problem. So everyone from Ohio is hoping for southerly winds and everyone who's probably on the phone from Ontario is hoping for northerly winds. Easterly winds becomes a Michigan problem. Um, that's kind of how this goes. But they can be anywhere. It is very common, by the way, for the bloom to come out and go around. This is, this is actually the bloom of water from the Detroit River. It's very common for the bloom to go out there. And so it's not unusual. You might be fine closer to shore with a, with a problem as you go further out. So it's important to track this. When you said you're forecasting a six, and eight was last year? Yes. Yeah. Was eight forecast or was eight what it actually turned? That was actually was last year. We forecast the seven last year. You forecast the seven and yeah. to be eight. Yeah. Okay. And that does not mean we consistently underestimate. <laughs> we overestimate in 16, so, which I say was the only one fall year. Um, the note Russell mentioned, the Sentinel-3, we just started using a little last year. It was not completely calibrated. Um, we're using it, we're going to be using it mostly. The first few bulletins you've seen this year have all had Sentinel 3A data. Um, and, oh, and Sentinel, what's great about this grade? Back up? Probably not. 
Um, Sentinel-3B, the sister satellite, was launched in April. Sentinel-3 right now is, is about every other day. Next summer, we will have every day with this data. And Sentinel-3B reports from the European Space Agency is that it looks at least as good as 3A. It's very cool. They've been running it. It's flying in space 30 seconds behind the other. The two satellites are 30 seconds apart in order to intercalibrate them. Very cool. I'd be happy to talk about that for a long time. <laughs> um, Did you see it every other day now? It will be right now. It's every other day, on average. And so you can see the difference. It's you can see patches ten times smaller. There's the old tree on the top, a modus at the same day on the bottom. You can see how this is pretty blocky, and how much smoother. And a real value to that is not only the resolution, but the model Russell talked about, the three-dimensional model we're using. Having this higher resolution means you see this fine grid. That means we're doing a much better job of inputs into the model. So the model's not working with a blocky data set. It's a much smoother data set. So we'll get a better job of actually forecasting where the bloom is with this model that we're using, this 3D model. And that's just in 3B, not, not in 3A, right? The, the, the 3A and 3B are both this high resolution, exactly the same sense. Do they both penetrate as deep to give you the Exactly the same. Everything's the same. That they're intended that way. So they're looking, the Europeans are looking long term. They've actually issued the contract for 3C and 3D. So we're expecting 20 years of data. I expect in 20 years, we don't, we will continue to do this, but we won't have to. <laughs> so we are not going to stop monitoring Lake Erie, but we should not have to. So, you, so with 3A right now, you're seeing um, near surface, near surface bloom. Okay, but what Russ was talking about was 3D below surface. Oh, the, we, use the, we use the satellite to r start the model. So the satellite data tells us where the bloom is, and then we, because the blooms go up and down the water, the 3D allows us to populate the whole water column. Tom, we'll walk around with microphones. Yeah. Let's, let's get through right. the talks and we'll ask some questions. Okay. Then all the people on the webinar can hear. So okay. Wait. So and also, of course, we have um, we have the bulletin. Um, I will note this is a bulletin from last week, and some of you were out in the lake. There was some scum out there. The bloom has started early this year, and you've. There are probably some concerns. You've also heard the lake is warmer this year. Probably you, some of you have seen that. That's about uh, 7 degrees Fahrenheit warmer at this point than in past in climatological. That does not mean we're going to have a worse bloom. Temperature, it grows faster in warm water, but we need phosphorus. If it runs out of phosphorus, it stops growing. That's the key factor. So just to get an example, this is this year. We're running, um, these are thresholds for temperature. This is this year. You can see very early, end of May, we had um, 68 Fahrenheit, which is the threshold for optimal growth. And it actually touched at 77, 25 degrees there. These are the other years, which are later. But I'd like to note 2013, which was a bad year, we didn't hit these thresholds until three weeks later. And we had a severe bloom. The issue is the phosphorus flow. So we may see, we saw a little scum, we'll see a little more, but it does not mean we're going to have a worse bloom this year. It just means it's going to start, it started up earlier. We may hit, uh, the timing may go a little bit earlier overall. So overall of the forecast, severity six, <clears throat> um, uncertainties between five and seven and a half, and that uncertainties in the models or disagreement, differences between the models on that, which we should be able to resolve. So we hope in future years we'll be able to tighten those up. Um, again, the warm water does not mean a larger bloom. It's, it's about the phosphorus. That's the key question. I can't emphasize enough the impact of where the bloom is depends on the wind. So it's important not to go on the assumption. It's treat this like you're in Ohio. I, I looked this up. There are seven to eight thunderstorm days every month in the summer in Ohio. That doesn't stop you from going out and playing golf or going boating, just because there might be a thunderstorm. So please get the bulletin and use it. Look at it. Um, and uh, a lot of the lake will be fine, most of the central basin, but even in the western basin, there are areas that will be good. And right now, they are good. The bloom take, it has to grow. It doesn't suddenly appear like even aliens from outer space, they have to grow usually. They don't just go up um, instantly. So, um, uh, thank you all. That's what we have here. So, so we'll get to questions in just a second. So that's the critical part of this uh, discussion is we need the loading data that comes from Heidelberg and from Laura Johnson, and then we need the NOAA expertise and the NOAA support to run the forecast. 
Um, there's been a lot of great kind words about Sea Grant and Stone Lab today, but clearly there's 25 content experts in the room today too. And so I, I want to take the opportunity in the last 15 minutes here before we get to the Q&A is to really highlight, as, as the slide says, Ohio current research in this, this space. And so just to get into this um, presentation, I have some animations in here too, so I'll try and walk us through. But this is kind of the funding cycle that we've looked at since the Toledo crisis in 2014. So what you're seeing in the early online, um, as soon as that crisis happened, in 2015, OSU's College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences mobilized a million dollars to fund five projects. The great thing about that funding that came out of the college was with the, the um, dean of that college, Bruce McFerrin, at that time, went down to the state capitol and asked what the state could do to help also. And the Ohio Department of Higher Education clearly stepped up. And you can see from FY 2015 all the way down through FY 18, we have seen about $2 million go towards research um, annually. What I've had here listed after each bullet point is the projects that are completed now, those that are done but in a reporting set, and those that have just started, we had money awarded in April of this year, so there's projects now, those nine plus 11, so those 20 projects started in April. And then we have Ohio Sea Grant projects that have been running on in the background um, for many years. There is some remaining funds out there, and to see things like um, Representative Arndt and Gardner put Senate Bill 299 out there, knowing that that effort and those dollars are gonna be invested, we can layer the remaining 2.4 on top of those projects. We're in a great place to take this money and leverage it across um, other efforts. So what I wanna really do is walk you through and, and, and make you aware of the amazing scientists that you have in this state, many of them in the room. And so I'm gonna kinda of walk through this harmful algorithm research initiative. So this is what we set out to do from a big picture. We started out, we're, we had to figure out how to produce clean drinking water. Yes, we have aspirations to reduce um, phosphorus loads by 40% relative to 2008, but right out of the gates, we need to know that we can turn on our faucets and drink water. We also know that in the second bullet, we need to look at human health impacts. So when you do come in contact with this toxin, what are the likely risks that are there? Moving on, we need to know how these blooms behave. And I will talk a lot about that today and show you some of the research experts in the room. And then we also need to know how nutrients run off the system. And there are also some people in the room that can address some of those questions you might have. And then the last bullet here is information sharing and collaboration. Um, Dr. Callender mentioned this, uh, Dr. Thur mentioned this. You know, it's key as we try and move the needle on these nutrient inputs that we're, that we're working collaboratively towards these um, efforts. And that's what this slide is really supposed to illustrate. This idea that this isn't just federal agencies on the left-hand side or state agencies on the right-hand side, the NGOs, organizations like the Farm Bureau, but all of these universities at the, at the bottom are either leading one of these research projects or are co-collaborators on these projects. The work we're doing in Ohio right now couldn't be done if these groups were not communicating. I'm seeing more communication across universities than I ever have in my career, and I'm seeing communication across universities and agencies. It's been a, you know, it's not, fun to have to work on a crisis to force this interaction, but I think in Ohio, relative to many other states, there's a lot of interaction going on that you're not seeing perhaps in other parts of the country. So there's reports that are out, they were downstairs in the table, these panels uh, I was hoping were coming in, in succession, but basically there are reports down there that have all the projects, there's a 2016 report that tells you about what happened in 2015, there's a 2017 report that talks about 15 findings, but then also what's going on for 16, and then hopefully you'll anticipate in 2018 in September, um, we have hosted, this year will be the third year, we host the State of the Science meeting in Toledo at the Stranahan. That'll happen again. It's on September 13th. 13th, thank you, September 13th, it's a Thursday. We plan to roll out this final or this next report at that event. Um, we will be sure that those in the room have, uh, have an invitation to that event. So the four categories we talk on, the first one I want to hit on is tracking blooms from the source. Um, this is the infographic from that report. This is the crib out near um, Maumee Bay um, where the Toledo gets its, its intake water from. These are the projects that fall into this category, and, and I recognize you won't be able to see them from where you're sitting, but just to help me point out the people that are in the room doing this great work. So on the uh, left-hand side, we have round one. So this is work that started in 2015. We have HABS detection and mapping happening in Sandusky Bay and um, Maumee Bay. So for Sandusky Bay, we have both Mike McKay and George Boljan, if you could stand up. There's Mike McKay, George Boljan. And then for the Toledo monitoring, we have Dr. Tom Bridgman in here. And so if you want to know about their work with placing buoys and helping to inform water intake plants, those are your experts and they're people that you should be speaking with. 
Moving down below that, you've already spoken with Heidelberg. Um, they've got a round of funding in round one and in round two to really look at a small watershed. What happens if you track how many best management practices are putting, being put in those watersheds and what is the resulting reduction in nutrients? So if you want to know about that, a lot of it's going on in Rock Creek and Honey Creek. Laura Johnson would be the one to talk with. Um, all of us know who Laura Johnson is. Um, Mike McCain, George Bojan, we're also looking at um, toxicity of Planktothrix and Sandusky Bay. Maumee Bay and, and the Western Basin of Lake Erie get a lot of attention. When you look at the forecast, when it's, when it's red, that means high concentrations of these organisms. But if you look, Sandusky Bay is red way earlier than Maumee Bay and stays red way longer than Maumee Bay. And it's the work that George Bojan and, and, and Mike McKay that are doing from Bowling Green State University that help us address that. Um, even the Central Basin up here in the top right, um, our very own Dr. Justin Chaffin, where's Justin at? Good. So the research coordinator for Stone Lab, he's doing a lot of sampling efforts and things out in the Central Basin to look at the nutrient dynamics, the fluxes, and what happens with Central Basin blooms. Uh, moving down here, we, we definitely have work that's going on in the modeling efforts. We have Dr. Jay Martin here today. Is Margaret Kalsik in the room? Dr. Kalsik was not able to make it up today. Dr. Jay Martin is one of the researchers working on the ensemble modeling. So looking at the places in Ohio in the watershed that are, are potential sources of those nutrients, whether it's DRP um, or whether it's uh, total phosphorus or particulate phosphorus, and not only Jay, but there are four other modeling groups working together. To echo Rick's thought, if you're going to model, it's nice to come at it from using different modeling techniques. So if you want to know where um, some of the particulate phosphorus sources and dissolved reactive phosphorus sources are in the watershed, Jay's the one to talk to. Within that modeling, he's also looking at if you implement BMPs across the landscape, what resulting reduction in phosphorus might you see? So please seek out Jay while you're, while you're here. And then Mike McKay, he's our, our resident Canadian, so he does a lot of our winter work or early spring work. He's the only one that wants to be out there when it's cold. So if you want to know what's going on as far as nutrients and um, phosphorus in, in the early spring, um, Dr. McKay is the one to talk to. Again, we did a lot of work in safe drinking water. Not a lot of these uh, content experts are here, but I want to pull up this slide just to remember you, remind you there is some really amazing cutting edge stuff going on right now. I will not talk about every one of these, but basically each one of these bullets is a project that has been put in place to help water treatment plant operators do their job. We do have the pleasure of having Kelly Fry in the audience. Kelly, if you want to raise your hand. Um, operates one of our water treatment plants um, in Ohio. And so these are the sorts of things when we roll out the findings from these projects, um, Kelly gets very, very excited about this stuff. And so some of the things that are here, we're looking at new biofilters to remove the toxins. We're looking at things like how do we um, dose powder-activated carbon or algicides in some of our reservoirs. We now know that we can bubble ozone and UV radiation to remove these toxins. And so the tools, technologies, and trainings that our water treatment plant operators have now to remove toxins is phenomenal. And I would argue we're leading um, many states in this regard. Um, if you want to know anything about this, again, some of the content experts aren't in the room, but I'd be happy to answer questions for you. A lot of this work is coming out of the University of Toledo and a lot of the work coming out of the University of Cincinnati. Moving on, we, we do, um, and as I mentioned, we, we are focusing on some public health concerns. Um, this is an infographic, again, from that report. Um, I will highlight last year we had Dr. Stu Ludson come and give a talk at the webinar talking about um, fish flesh. So if you're catching walleye yellow perch that are in these blooms with toxins, are the fish safe to eat? And the data coming back from that shows that if you're following the existing fish consumption advisories put out by the DNR every year, if you're consuming at that level, the fish are safe to eat. But other things in here about if we water crops with water that has toxins in it, does it get stored in the crops and how do we handle that? Um, and so a lot of this work on human health, if you want to pull me aside, I can tell you about some of the findings from this research, but I can also put you in contact with the people that you need to be speaking with. Um, we're also doing a lot of stuff in this engaging stakeholders. So we need to make sure that everybody has the right information in hand. So we're trying to build websites uh, that have um, all the information in one place. Um, and so that's this information coming from um, University of Toledo. Um, Dr. Greg Labarge is also in the audience. Greg Labarge sitting in the back. Greg Labarge is doing a lot of that farmer interface and working with farmers to help them recognize which best management practices are best for their field. Um, Greg Labarge is with the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences at Ohio State, um, and he is building a, a best management practice website. So farmers can go in there and kind of decide which practice might be best for them. In the room that, that are here today that we invited aren't in some of these funding routes that we've mentioned already, but they're people that you need to know 
are doing amazing things. And so I wanted to draw some of these people to your attention. Margaret, Margaret Kelsick isn't here today, but she's working with Jay Martin on the multi-modeling work. But in the new model they're working on, they're trying to incorporate the influence of drain tiles on the movement of those nutrients off the system. They're also starting to incorporate um, application of manure and how manure is approached. So those models are being refined through time. But again, Dr. Mike McKay is here. Um, he's looking now, he got a new grant um, out of the new Ohio Department of Higher Education funding looking at viral activity in some of these blooms. So the water treatment plant operators can be looking at the virus loads associated with these blooms, not just the toxin loads. Um, Tom Bridgman is leading um, our open water impairment sampling. Many of you in the room probably recognize, and I'm going to read a letter from Director Butler here in a second, um, that a team of scientists were pulled together to help Ohio EPA find a way to designate um, whether the open waters of the Western Basin are impaired from a recreation standpoint. Um, that um, science has been out there. I have to thank Rick Stump. He was part of that team, and his tool was used to help with that impairment designation. But the importance of that is that that is on the tool we have right now, but it brought up a lot of questions about how do you appropriately measure these, these toxins and these blooms and, and the scums that form. And so we've got extra funding to continue to refine that ability to um, sample the, the status or the health of the lake. Uh, John Bratton's in the room. John, can you wave your hand again? Great. So John is one of the ones from Limnotech that helps with uh, one of the alternate models or the coupled models that Rick uses. But the other thing I want to bring up with John Bratton is he's on an EcoHab grant. And for that, John Bratton, Tom Bridgman is also on that, and then um, Justin Chaffin. EcoHab project, it's a three-year funded NOAA grant, and what it's trying to do is layer on top of Rick's forecast. Right now, what we can show is what we think the bloom size will be, but there's not a good indication of the toxicity of that bloom. And so these three researchers with other folks that aren't here today, John and, and, and Justin and, and Tom, are all working on being able to model toxicity. So it's not just where the bloom is, how big it'll be, but maybe how toxic it is. Moving on, um, we got Angelica Vasquez Ortiga from Bowling Green State University. Um, she's doing a lot of work with carbon, and one of the things she's got a grant to do right now is to look at, or she's got a grant in the hopper right now to look at nitrogen and phosphorus removal through drain tiles. So if a drain tile is coming off a field and you run it through um, a structure, can we absorb or remove some of those nutrients before they make it into the system? Jim Hood's also here. Jim, if you want to stand up from Ohio State University. Jim is uh, starting to look into work to figure out what streams contribute to the nutrient load. And so there's a lot of questions out there. Is, are the streams themselves providing nutrients to the systems, or are those streams actually sucking down nutrients that aren't making it into the lake? And so Jim and some of his colleagues are working in that direction, again, also from Ohio State University. And then Steve Wilhelm, where's Steve at? Steve's in the room, too. Also, he comes all the way up from Tennessee, maybe traveled the furthest to get here today. Yeah? So, <laughs> so Steve does a lot with microcystis, so he looks at how varying conditions in the lake, temperature, nutrients can affect those blooms. But he also, like uh, Mike McKay, looks at the virus activity within those blooms. I just want you to know, I mean, there are a lot of amazing things going on right here. There's a lot of funds that have been put forward, thank you, to the Ohio Department of Higher Education and, and NOAA and the Sea Grant Program. But you've got a lot of content experts here today. I've just kind of scratched the surface um, for what we've got going on here, um, but I wanted to do one last plug. This is um, directed towards Ohio State, but I will say it's not only at OSU. And at OSU and the college, we're, we're under what we're calling a water quality initiative, and I know UT has modeled this also. What we're trying to do within our universities is not stay within a department and figure out who's working on water issues, but go across colleges and across departments. And so I know UT has economists, um, policy folks, um, chemists and water people all working together on these questions. We've quickly realized that uh, we need to attack these from multiple disciplines. So I'm going to end before we turn it over to the Q&A. I just want to read a letter that I had mentioned that I received from um, Director Butler from the EPA. He was tentatively on the schedule. We thought he might be able to um, attend today, but it didn't work out. But he sent along this um, letter, and it's related to, again, the impairment designation that I mentioned. So it says, um, uh, this is from, again, uh, EPA Director, Ohio EPA Director Craig Butler. I want to express my appreciation for the ass assistance of the Ohio State University Sea Grant College Program, Bowling Green State University, University of Toledo, and NOAA. Um, as you know, Ohio EPA is charged with determining if waters of Lake Erie should be listed as impaired in accordance with the Clean Water Act, which is Section 303D. He says that as there were no established methods or criteria to conduct that assessment related to harmful algal blooms and impairment, I turn to the professionals most knowledgeable about the Lake Erie algal blooms for assistance in developing this method. The research knowledge 
but algal bloom issues and the understanding of the lake data and technical details helped me and my staff submit a 303D list to the EPA, and that was actually approved just Monday, July 9th. And so the Ohio or the federal EPA has approved Ohio EPA's methodology for impairment designation. So again, um, I want to say that it, you know this is great to have Noah here. It's great to have Heidelberg here. OSU is happy to serve as a host for this at Stone Lab, but. Clearly, the work that's being done right now couldn't be done without the efforts across the entire state. And so I just wanted to make, take time out of the day-to-day uh, -to, -day to kind of um, make that known to everybody in the room. So that's the end of the formal presentations. What we're going to do now is we have um, a little over an hour, so the webinar is running till 1 o'clock. What we want to do with the two mics that we have in the room, we're going to open up for the first part of this to make sure the, the, the invited media folks have time to ask questions. Um, the speakers, so Rick and I will come to the front of the room, but if you have questions about any of the research that I just mentioned here as far as virus loads or the EcoHab grant, please feel free to ask them now. We can bring the content experts up to speak about that. We'll, we'll designate maybe the first 15, 20 minutes here in the room, and then the staff in the back have been taking um, questions through the chat function on the webinar. So really we're here to kind of just field the questions that you might have relative to the loading information and, um, and the forecast. Please. Thank you. Um, my question deals with when you're talking about the models and they're different, just generally for a layperson, what are the differences between the types of models? The, um, is that on? Uh, I'm uh, there's a range of answers. Uh, a, a, a key part is how they handle different components. So, um, uh, for example, I'll start. Uh, one of the models we have is um, a statistical relationship, um, in which it's a statistical one. So we know phosphorus rises the bloom. We look at past years. How big was the bloom compared to the amount of phosphorus going in? Very straightforward, statistical. The, another side with uh, the Limitech W. Lee model, Western Lake Erie ecosystem model, is a process model. So it'll take the phosphorus from every day and then grow an algae and from the amount of phosphorus and based on the temperature, water temperature, so it calculates the water temperature from the sun. So it goes through this from a completely different approach. Um, when we actually did the work for the, um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, the two completely different models came up with the same answers on that, which is a very compelling reason to indicate that, well, we're seen to be in the right direction because such fundamental. So those are key differences. There are other nuances, for example, um, what's called internal loading, which is phosphorus that's already in the lake that came from other years. Um, some of the models treat that as more or less important, and so that will come out as a factor, uh, how that comes in. So those are kind of the core, some emphasis of different things and also how they operate. And if the question, if you ask where you're coming from and, and what uh, unit you represent. Gary Wilson, Detroit Public Television. For Dr. Johnson, you referred to target. Uh, do you define target and does that equate to a TMDL if there was one? All right, yeah. So. Um, so the, the targets that I presented were those that were set through the it, essentially an effort of uh, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. There were a group of folks that came together. They were called the Objectives and Targets Task Team. Jeff Warder is here, and he was head of co-chair of that group, so he could um, also correct me if I say anything slightly incorrectly here. Uh, but essentially, we came together, and a lot of the same people who have developed these models to forecast the size of the bloom also use those models to help determine, all right, well, at what level of loading do we get what we would consider to be um, an acceptable bloom, right? And that acceptable or minimum bloom was decided to be around 2012, which was also equivalent to 2004. It's about the same as a 40% reduction in phosphorus loading compared to 2008. So I say a target, but really it should be considered a maximum load, right? Like if you get over that number, you're probably going to have a bigger bloom than what we want. So what we're saying is that 90% of the time or nine times out of 10, we need to be less than that. So you should consider it more not where we want to go, but what we want to be below. 
Does that make sense? It does, but does that, does that equate to a TMDL, which has the word maximum in it? So the follow-up was, uh, how does that relate to a TMDL? Right. Uh, yeah, so it's not exactly the same as a TMDL. They're, um, you know, it's calculated slightly differently. TMDLs are usually uh, river-centric, uh, but it's not entirely different either. So the, if you look at the TMDLs that are set by river, it might not necessarily match up to that. Oftentimes they don't have, I mean, for the, this Annex 4 work, we had a focus on dissolved phosphorus since that's the thing that's changed so much since the blooms have come back, um, and that's what was low when the blooms weren't here. So there's a lot of focus on that, which you usually don't see so much of in a TMDL. So that's, that's the added advantage there. Yep. Uh, this is for Rick. Um, Rick, uh, I'm looking forward to a mild weather the rest of July as much as everyone, but um, isn't that potentially also a bad thing in terms of algae. The, the phosphorus is out there, and, and with stagnant, uh, stagnant air, little wind, don't you have a better uh, chance of having scums, scums formed? I, wouldn't it be better to have a little bit of wind, a little bit of storm to break up the uh, scum formation? Okay. Um, with the weather, the, we, can't, okay, we can't forecast the wind out that far. Um, that's probably one of the, the worst forecasts that can be uh, most difficult forecast to do. So it's it's really the forecast as far as the systems that would lead to precipitation in the atmosphere. Um, as far as the the point of whether mild weather, if we have um, calmer weather, there is more likely to be scum formation. What that means is whatever is available in the bloom will come up to the surface. So you can have the same amount of bloom present, but if it's mixed it's less concentrated. It's diluted through the whole water column. So your concern, and a reasonable concern from boaters, um, the charter boat, I see Dave Spangler and Paul Pachowski there, um, which they would much prefer a little bit of wind to keep it mixed down into the water. Because if it accumulates, that's the worst possible situation for the boating and swimming. We, we can't, there's no way to forecast uh, what the winds are likely to be weeks out in the summertime. The models just don't, don't work that well. Um, it won't change the, but it will change is the appearance of the bloom. That's probably a key part. If we go back to last September, it was extremely calm for a week in September. At the same time, there was actually a regrowth of the bloom. It's a whole other story that I could talk to you at some other time. But it was so calm that all of that was at the surface. And so there was a huge amount of bloom, and we could all see it, how much was there at once. Karen Schaefer, Freelance Public Radio. Um, this is really a question for Laura Johnson, I think. Laura, you were talking about um, are we making progress, are we seeing progress? Maybe we aren't, maybe we're not. We have to wait and see. But our governor didn't wait and see. He's just signed an executive order which is going to mandate new practices. We don't know what those are yet exactly on farmers in Northwest Ohio, presumably in the Maumee River drainage. Um, is that going to have any impact on speeding things up or is it still a wait and see? So I, I will be honest that I uh, briefly reviewed what I saw in the executive order just after I arrived here from a copy that Jeff gave me, so I am not an expert on this at all. What I've seen is that they have targeted some of the higher contributing watersheds sort of in the southern part of the Maumee River for areas that should be getting certain practices. The words I saw specifically was the nutrient management plans. Um, so I'm guessing that uh, farmers are going to be expected to get nutrient management plans. They're just making the watersheds distressed so it matches up with what they did in Grand Lake St. Mary's, which was to require nutrient management plans there. Um, and theory, that should be very effective. You know, if you are measuring what phosphorus is there and you're then putting on the right amount, then that should be a really good way to go. Um, what it would, the, we'd have to see follow through that after you get a nutrient management plan that it's being followed. Um, I also think, however, that placement of phosphorus, especially in the Lake Erie Basin, is important. So whether you're putting phosphorus on the surface or below the surface, 
you know, injecting it below two inches is going to play a big role into how effective it's going to be. So, you know, my call would be to also include some measurements of phosphorus accumulation on the surface of the soil associated with how uh, fertilizer has been applied as to how effective it's going to be. How quickly it's going to be effective, that's a whole other question. So that really depends on how, what the soil test levels are. We know that if, if levels are elevated, it can take a while to see those reductions. And what we're relying on is what we call drawdown. So we're basically saying, you know, if we start doing the right things and then we are harvesting crops, the crops will take away phosphorus that's drawing down the phosphorus pool, um, and then we'll get to lower levels, and then we'll, you know, sort of reevaluate how much phosphorus to apply over time. So that process, depending on how high the soil test levels, can take a very long time or can take a not so long time. I mean, some of the data I've seen from Steve Coleman um, looking at soil fertility is suggested just within one or two crop rotations, you can see, um, you know, slightly elevated levels go down to something that, you know, you might even need to worry about. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of potential there. I mean, I tell everyone that's the first step, you know. If they're like, what do you tell a farmer to do? Uh, test your soil and don't add too much phosphorus. So uh, it seems right to me. So when we think about this, at least for me, I think about it kind of from three perspectives. The nutrient application occurring now, so how do we handle that, and the 4R program is a great way to be addressing that. Then there is, as what Laura mentioned too, there's the phosphorus that's already there. There are some locations within the watershed that are going to have elevated phosphorus, so finding ways to draw down those is another one. But the one we cannot forget, and, and Laura does a good job of plugging it in her talks, is water management is that third bucket. So we need to worry about nutrient management today and how we can address that, and through nutrient management plans and toolbars that farmers are using, and from BMPs that a Greg Labarge and OSU Extension can recommend. You know, those are things for today. We need to be working in that, um, what's often been termed legacy. There's never a really good definition for that, but, but phosphorus in the fields from the past. And some of those elevated fields from the past aren't through malicious intent by anybody in the watershed. Some of these things are things that were recommended to farmers, you know, three decades ago. So what we're learning about how to farm and how to manage our landscape has changed dramatically. But water management is going to be a key thing going forward. Tom, I'm going to come back to you in just a second here. Thank you. Um, it was mentioned that the forecast or expectation for precipitation in uh, the remainder of July is uh, uh, low or uh, lower than average. Uh, how does precipitation in August or even early September affect uh, things? Uh, there's pretty much no impact for those. It's, it's so late in the season, there's not time for the phosphorus to drive into that. Uh, we have actually a very good example of that in 2007 when there was a, a actual flood in late August, and the 2007 loom was one of the smallest ones we saw. It's, it's really too late to get it going. And Rick, when you say too late, it's because the temperatures are going to start coming down they to get out of the optimal. Down, you load. start getting the front, you start get the fronts coming through the winds, it's, um, and so it's, it ends up being too late um, overall. So we don't expect that to happen. So that's, that's our overall assessment. Um, one more in front of you, and then I got you, sir. Gary Wilson, Detroit Public Television. We've been the beneficiary of tremendous presentations here, but from a first-time attendee, uh, the ag community is sort of conspicuous by its absence. Uh, is there a reason why uh, the ag uh, community didn't pres present here? Yeah, so um, we, the format of, the, of this event just changed for this year. So before we had done it where it was a, a, a press briefing, where we met really primarily with the press. They got the loading and the, and the forecast, and then they left. And then there was a two-hour webinar that happened later. And what we did for that was actually bring in different sectors. So we had one that talked about fish health last year, one that talked about water treatment options last year. Um, Greg Labarge, you presented on the ag field. And so we just tried to mix it up this, this year. So there is no intentional exclusion. I have the pleasure of working with a lot of ag groups, with corn and wheat, soybean, with the Farm Bureau. They knew this event was coming on. There wasn't a intent to not have them there, they knew what was going on, and really it was just to do the forecast and then just a, an update on, on, on research. Um, I, you know, I, I get to work with the ag and a lot of the researchers sitting in the room, I know Jay Martin on his advisory boards for his model work has ag at the table having those discussions. And so um, it was, there wasn't an intentional exclusion, there wasn't them denying not coming here. It, there is active engagement outside of, outside of these um, talks. 
Steve Davis is in the back, and, and again, Greg, Greg, um, Greg Labarge from OSU, and, and they have a good pulse on, on what the farmers you know, are doing, what they want to do, what they're able to do. That's why coming back to Representative Art and Representative Gardner's bill, having that money in play to have staff to help with um, nutrient, developing nutrient management plans, getting money into the hands of farmers to purchase toolbars and equipment to do the right things. And so um, the ag community has been engaged in, in embracing this process. Okay, this is a little nerdy, but everything we're doing here is a little nerdy and it makes it kind of fun. Um, so I've uh, been talking to Tom Bridgman lately and he's kind of torn between the, um, the heat forming what he is torn between are these, are these mini blooms that he, he's seen come out earlier in the season sometimes, or is this the real main bloom that's, that's coming out? And so I thought we would maybe Maybe have Rick versus Tom, George Bullerjean, and Mike McKay, and anyone else who wants to jump in. And is this the real bloom, or are these what's out there now? Are they pockets of mini blooms? Okay. Uh, I can start off. Tom has certainly, over time, seen little bits of blooms in Mommy Bay, and the cyanobacteria has always shown up in June. At some point, yeah, pretty much always shown up in June. What has typically is what. So I can step back here. The satellite has an advantage of scale, has a disadvantage of we can't see the subtleties. So I can't see cells, but we can see scale. Um, and so if you have a very small amount of bloom, um, you can get these small pockets. They don't show up. They're not big enough. What we've seen, though, already this year is areas large enough that they clearly show up in the satellite, which we have not seen this early before. So. The way that's looking, I would say, yes, we, we are the start of the bloom for this year. And um, it's not a matter of this little bit is going to go away. Now, what is going to happen is um, there's not, it's not high concentration right now. And so you get, you get some wind, and you won't see it easily from a boat again. We had, uh, I think Steve Davis was out fishing probably, I'm sure you all, a, a week or two ago, and there was visible scum on a fairly calm day. The wind picks up, you won't see it. So that could give the impression that it appeared and disappeared. This, we've not seen this, this amount of area in early June or in early July in past years. That's, um, so it has started earlier. It's consistent with the temperature. Is there any way of trying to put that in a better perspective of how much more are you seeing, you know, in, in uh, July or June, June and early July? Compared to other years? Yeah. Well, past years was zero. <laughs> we hadn't seen anything from satellite in the first week of July. How much, I mean, Tom, I don't know if you could say whether you've seen, maybe you can answer how much earlier you've seen or whether a little more. I, I can, is this on? I, I can say that in probably four out of five years, we see a little bit of cyanobacteria growing in June, but it, it disappears usually before people notice it. Uh, around the beginning of July, this time of July, is usually fairly clear water. Uh, so to see this much cyanobacteria out there at this time of year is, is something I haven't seen in 17 years. It's the most I've ever seen. Um, and in speaking with Justin, who, uh, who monitors around the islands, we, we see that the, the water is greenish in color, but we're also monitoring, seeing that there's a lot of other healthy algae out there. There's a lot of diatoms, there's a lot of greens, the cryptophytes, so the greenish tint of the water is actually a lot of the healthy algae, which I think may be competing with the cyanobacteria right now and sort of keeping it uh, damped down a little bit. So it'll be interesting to say, see, I don't, I don't know that either you or I or anybody in this room can really predict what's going to happen over the next month because we haven't seen this before. Uh, I suspect that what we have now will sort of uh, stall. The bloom will not really get any worse for the next few weeks, might even uh, decrease in the next few weeks, but it will probably come back towards the end of July the way it usually does. That's what my guess is. Probably my key point on this is it started early, but that's not changing the size of what we expect it to be. So. It, I don't think it's going to get worse and worse over the month of 
That's our best guess. I would agree. As per usual, Tom has a follow-up, so let's hit him again. We're going to start limiting the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the bottom line, as a scientist, what, is, what does this mean to you, uh, other than anecdotally to say, well, 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 it was warm this year and the algae came early. I, nobody, nobody in the room here, scientists and journalists, will both get yelled at if we assign too much significance of climate change to one year, one event. But what does it mean? Now, to you as a scientist, what does it suggest? Maybe, maybe the bloom's going to be bigger than we think it is. It's arriving earlier. Does, does I mean, what does that mean to you? Okay, probably the key question is what happens over the month of July with this. Like, does it does it develop faster? The question we don't have an answer to, or does it just kind of stall? Because if it develops faster, if you look at a climate perspective, we end up with longer summers. There's potentially the blooms can last longer. And so we would have a different form of, of impact in that if you're still limited by phosphorus, but it's could they could it reach its maximum in July? I hope not, but we'll see. And then actually go into September, October. The climate risk is we end up with a longer summer, which means it's around for longer, possibly. But then there's a whole lot of other complications because we have pretty clear evidence that there's actually something that looks more like a double peak. The bloom actually seems to peak in August, seems to drop off a bit, and then come back in September. And in fact, the modeling uh, work, the process model that uh, Limnotech has, the WLE model, actually pre produces that as an output, which is pretty remarkable that um, we're getting the same result from what we're seeing on the imagery versus that. So there's other complications that but the long one on climate is there is a risk that we could have a longer period of time with the bloom, not worse, just longer. That's that would be a concern, and I think Tom's itching to say something. So. Right. I, I wanted to agree with you, Rick. Um, something you said in your presentation is there's a certain amount of fuel. There's, there's basically a certain amount of fuel for the algae out there right now, and that's that's mostly all that it's going to have for the summer, and that that amount of fuel or nutrients is going to determine the size of the bloom, which is what all these models predict. It could very well be that the bloom now is going to be, as you said, spread out over the summer. So instead of a big pulse of a giant bloom in August, it could be that we have a more mild bloom that's spread out over a longer period of time. So over time, if you integrate it all, it's the same amount of algae. It's just spread out over more time. So it, it, it could go either way. We'll know better. Ask us again in November. We'll have a really good answer. Well, and and that's, the, that's the key of this. I mean, this is the nature of the science, right? After this prediction here, Rick doesn't put the model on a shelf and wait for next year's loading data. All of these models are taking what you learned on where you missed, where you high, where you low. These are being modified on a regular basis. So it is, when, when you hear a big unknown, what, everybody goes back to the drawing board again, not fully to the drawing board, but recalibrates the model to adjust to these sorts of things. Question here. When, uh, for Chris, and whoever else is doing the uh, virus work. When you talked about viruses, are they affecting the microcystis levels and affecting the algal blooms, or are the viruses something else along for the ride from the farm fields that we need to worry about, and why do we need to worry about them? Good. No, this is why I invite 25 content experts, because I know no answers, so then I just hand the microphone off. Uh, th this is Mike McKay, Bowling Green State University, and I, I'm, I'm expecting some input from my colleague Steve Wilhelm, Tennessee, who's actually one of the, the, uh, the virus experts in, in North America, if not the world. But so the, uh, the viruses uh, affecting uh, the cyanobacteria in the lake are, are viruses that are specific for cyanobacteria. They're not, they're not coming from the, the, uh, the watershed. Okay, these are viruses that are, are propagated uh, most likely within the lake staying within the lake or, or transferring from lake to lake through, through uh, uh, atmospheric processes. Uh, the, so um, can you begin the question? I, I, when, when you talked about the viruses and is it that they affect the levels of the microsystem? Like are they like bacteriophages okay. good, that want to kill them? Yeah, good question. So, so, so that's, that's our interest in this is uh, how, the, how the viruses might actually result in the in the transformation of the of the of the toxin microcystin 
from the particulate state where it's contained within cells, which for, from the water treatment perspective can be easier to manage, uh, versus into the soluble state where it gets released from the cells through lysis, uh, through the viruses rupturing the cells, uh, and uh, becomes soluble in, in, the, uh, in the water column now, which may be more difficult uh, to, to treat or require a little more stringent treatment uh, at, the, at the treatment plant. Steve, you nailed it. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Because we have some coming in for good. We'll get right behind you to Kelly Fry, and then we'll start moving to some of the online chat that's coming in. Please, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kelly Fry. I'm the sanitary engineer for Ottawa County, and Ottawa County includes Gibraltar Island here and, and the islands, and also to um, a big portion of the coast along um, Lake Erie here. We operate a water treatment plant that serves the eastern portion of Ottawa County, and I'm responsible for the operations manager. So I wanted to also thank everybody here, Ohio State, Ohio Sea Grant, Heidelberg, University of Toledo, Bowling Green, all the researchers there have done a great job supporting the water industry, and for all the listeners to know that that's, that's important to us. We can rely on those. We have questions. We questions. A lot of the research is being done directed towards water treatment and how to maximize the system. But there's also one thing here I think is somewhat missing that seems to get passed by, and for the charter boat people, for the, everybody that deals with it on a daily basis, we draw our water from Lake Erie. We have to treat it. Everybody drinks it. We want everybody not to think about what's in the water, but how good it tastes. But there is a sense of urgency. For uh, Rick, Noah's been just incredible. To, uh, have um, we need to be able to predict, and we're all here for predictions how soon this is going to subside. I was really happy to see that this year is less than last year. That's absolutely good. But we need to have confidence that the lake is getting cleaner have confidence in our systems and not have to be looking beyond as to what we have to do to increase our, our ability to decrease the water, but to continue to do So for everybody here, if you're looking to get predictions, I would really appreciate to know how soon we can see Feel comfortable was or what that we are getting results that we need. Yeah, and, and, and so I, I think that's the million dollar question in the in the room. I, I do when I look at the the grant portfolio that um, that OSU in concert with UT. I didn't pull this out earlier in the conversation. It was in an animation, but those Ohio Department of Higher Education grants are being managed by both OSU and University of Toledo. Um, when we looked at those grants early on, it was kind of a triage approach. Like we knew we know we needed to lower nutrients because that could lower the blooms. But we had drinking water issues now, and we had human health analysis that we had to do now. And so I can tell you that a lot of the research that's going on now or being redirected is to go more to the nutrient loading component. Um, the other problem with that nutrient loading component is we're talking about over 4 million acres in Ohio, 7.2 million acres, I think, in the entire Western Basin, rough numbers. That's a lot of acres of land to address. We also know, and, and again, thanks to uh, uh, Representative Ardner, uh, Arndt and Gardner, if you look, and we have, we've surveyed that agricultural community, many of those individuals want to be part of that solution. But some of the solutions that we need to, to give them is what BMP works for which farm. A farm isn't a farm isn't a farm isn't a farm. And so you, you do need some specialized recommendations. There are some blanket things that we know, incorporating and don't apply, you know, fertilizer at certain time and things like that for our program. But we need to also assist that sector of the community, and that's why bills like Gardner and Art, where we're going to be able to get trained individuals in there to, to do nutrient management plans and get toolbars that do inject these things in the soil. So the problem is, is that the, the, the problem we're facing now with this nutrient input, arguably that could be the heavier the lift of the issues we had. Um, not that the work that was done on water treatment and on human health was easy research to do, but it was the one that needed to be done out of the gates. And so I, I will actually, you know, direct my eyes back to uh, Greg Labarge and, 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 and um, see if there's any other comments. But really what we're looking at here is, is we need to make sure the resources are in the right place, and we need to know, you know, do we apply those, those practices 
blanketly over the watershed. Some of the modeling work that Jay Martin and Margaret Kelsick are doing is saying targeting is probably the way to go. And so we're in that space right now, and I can tell you that you know, we're working hard to, to lower the nutrients. I come back to Rick. I hope Sentinel C and D, when they're up there, we don't even have to use them because we're not monitoring a bloom in the lake anyway. And that's where we all want to be ultimately. Does anybody want to follow up those comments that's in the audience? I'll just say one thing for Senator Art, or excuse me, Representative Art and Senator Gardner. They've been great supports in this latest bill that got passed. It's just, just a feeling for us that it's going towards the, the resources that are needed to do more, more research, and I, I certainly appreciate that also. Thank you, Kelly. I, I Please. I'm not sure I have something. Do you want to add? Okay. I, by the way, like here, so I'm looking. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I know. Well, so I'm going to give an example instead. About the first of August. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, so my example, you know, this executive order that just came out, and a lot of this effort is based off of some results um, from Grand Lake St. Mary's, uh, which is data that we collected, and I worked with uh, Stephen Jackman from Wright State uh, Lake Campus to help, you know, analyze this data. Uh, so what we analyzed was Chickasaw Creek, which is one of the small tributaries to Grand Lake. And, you know, Grand Lake was declared a distressed watershed. If I remember correctly, it was like 2011, but then a manure ban went on in 2013. So there's a lot of efforts that basically happened from 2011 on. Well, we've been monitoring there since 2008, so we had some before data and some after data. Um, and over that period of time, we actually have seen some decreases, which frankly I was surprised about because it was like concentrate, you know, soil test levels are going to be so high at Grand Lake from the historical manure applications that we're never going to see a decrease. It's going to be decades before we see anything. Well, we've seen about a 20% decrease in nitrogen nitrate concentrations as well as uh, total phosphorus. Dissolved phosphorus hasn't changed nearly as much, but it depends on what level of flow you have. Um, and so what that could mean to you is that, you know, over less than a decade, we can start to see some changes. What everyone has missed saying about Grand Lake St. Mary's is that the levels coming out of Chickasaw Creek are still at least, at a minimum, two times higher for dissolved phosphorus than anything we measure in Lake Erie and for our, our monitoring program. And nitrate is probably more like, I would say, four times higher. So a 20% decrease is like, yeah, that's great. Still far too high. And if we want to be lower than we are in Lake Erie, we've got a long ways to go for Grand Lake. Okay, so there's a lot more to, to move there. But if the needle can move there within the period of time in which I've actually been at Heidelberg, I haven't been there for four years like everyone else, right, in our lab, then I think, well, except for Nate, Nate just joined, so I guess he's the newbie now. Um, but basically, I think that we should be more optimistic than maybe I should be. This is more to me. I should be more optimistic than I have been about the potential here. So, does that help a little bit? You want a year, but we're, we're, we're getting closer. I'm thinking to it. less than a decade. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to turn to uh, Christina Dirkus has been writing questions down. So we'll test my reading skills here. For uh, Dr. Johnson, all the practices addressed so far target inorganic sources of P, but is any research being done on practices? Um, to begin drawing down on legacy organic P? Um, so, yes, uh, you know, well, like the rules that have gone into place have a lot to do with uh, banning manure application on frozen ground or before precipitation. That also accounts for fertilizer. So there are some efforts in place there. Um, I guess where I would like to see more action, and I'm sure. Uh, Lake Erie Foundation would have, agree with me, <laughs> is that we would see more in terms of making sure that manure phosphorus is being applied at agronomic rates and not higher than that. So there is, you know, if you have a good nutrient management plan in place and places that do have that, clearly Grand Lake St. Mary's had that, then that's the effort and that's where it should be going. Um, you know, but I know that there's some difficult situations where there's not a lot of profit margin, that, that can be hard for farmers. So I would say we could use more incentives in that arena. Yep, great. I, I just wanted to add to Laura's comments there on the manure utilization in the basin. And um, we have a lot of work going on as far as in-crop utilization of manure, applying it in 
what would be that 4R fashion where we're actually making that application within the crop. The crop is able to utilize that nutrient and replacing the commercial fertilizer that would have been added. Um, and that adds to, you know, the economics and able to move that manure around the watershed. Um, also, uh, you know, provide some incentives for farmers to really take a look at uh, maybe even moving it from a livestock farm to a non-livestock farm in relationship to uh, the application. So there is a lot of in innovation going on from an application standpoint and timing in relationship to manure utilization. A lot of the work out of OSU is coming from uh, Glenn Arnold, um, so if you want to contact information for Glenn, we can get you that too. Um, Tim Brown from TIMACOG, uh, first off, uh, thank you for your partnership in working together to address this issue. Can you tell us anything more about the growing oxygen depleted zone um, in the center of Lake Erie that doesn't necessarily show up on satellite images? Anybody want to take a first cut at hypoxia or I can... Oh, volunteers. Okay, so for those of uh, on the call that don't understand, the hypoxia often referred to as the dead zone, which is not my favorite term for it. Um, but basically, there is um, s some evidence out there that the, the size of these blooms that are occurring, these harmful algal blooms, as they move from west to east, settle to the bottom of the basin, um, and you're going to have decomposition that draws that oxygen out. So there is some information that that bloom has becoming, or that dead zone has started onset earlier and is in larger size than it has been historically. Um, that was part of the work under Annex um, 4, and so I'm actually going to hand the phone to Jeff Reuter because he can talk about some of the things that we're calling for as far as what Annex 4 is looking for. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I think the key thing, and this gets back to a question that was asked earlier about the challenges or, or do, should we be concerned with a heavy amount of rain in August or September, in order to deal with hypoxia, the target from Annex 4 was a 40% reduction in annual loading rather than spring loading. So the things that happen in August and September and throughout the rest of the year are very important to the uh, extent and I'll say the severity of hypoxia within the central basin, both being the area that is covered and the amount of time that the area remains hypoxic. Hypoxia is defined as two milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen or less. So essentially, uh, our target for Annex 4 using six models, as Rick has, has, has suggested, was to come up with a reduction in phosphorus that would raise the average dissolved oxygen in the central basin cold bottom layer to above two milligrams per liter. Right now, your dissolved oxygen out here in the central basin is probably around eight, Justin could tell us. Uh, so we're, I mean, to raise it above two is, is not a big lift, but it's very important because as you get it above two, uh, let me say it a different way. When we get to anoxia, no dissolved oxygen in the bottom layer, when that happens, uh, the phosphorus that has been deposited into the bottom sediment redissolves into the water. And so there's a great advantage to stay above a hypoxic condition and you greatly reduce internal loading from the bottom sediments into the lake. That's a very long answer, probably more than you wanted, but uh, the, 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 the bottom line is our target, the 40% reduction, if we achieve it, it will greatly uh, improve the central basin hypoxia issue. Thank you, Jeff. Go ahead to that, John. Uh, there's several research projects underway related to the central basin hypoxia. Um, I didn't introduce myself, John Bratton from Linda Tech. Uh, one is a five year project funded by NOAA under the uh, Coastal Hypoxia Research Program uh, based at the Great Lakes Research Lab in Ann Arbor. Uh, with some University of Michigan researchers. That project is about halfway done. This year they're producing their first operational or quasi-operational forecasts of hypoxia for use by uh, drinking water plants primarily. The uh, city of Cleveland has been monitoring that for several years. Uh, Illinois, Indiana Sea Grant has also been putting out monitoring instruments. Uh, the difference is that none of those instruments except Cleveland's have been real time. So they collect the data, they, they bring in the instruments in the fall, they download the data and see 
uh, looking backwards, what happened. Uh, they're moving more now toward an operational forecasting capability that can't take advantage of satellites, uh, but is at least taking advantage of the, of the wind and the weather forecasts uh, for the benefit of drinking water plants. It's not a human health risk, but it is a taste and odor issue with water treatment. So there, there are a number of research projects getting underway a little bit, probably maybe five or ten years behind the harmful algal bloom research in the Western Basin. Um, one final note, the Army Corps of Engineers has issued a request for proposals for a project to model the entire lake, not just the Western Basin, uh, and that modeling effort will include incorporation of hypoxia, and then also in the Eastern Basin, incorporation of uh, macroalgae clidophora. Uh, so that project will, will be funded probably later this year into the fall, uh, starting off uh, into the spring of next year. So you'll see those products starting to come out maybe a year from now. So the next question of engineers with, uh, with GLRI money, yeah. Macroalgae, Clodophora, near shore. Thanks, thanks John. Um, question about can you expand more on the impairment designation under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of Lake Erie? And so basically for impairment, um, for the state of Ohio, every two years they, they submit a list up to federal EPA about those waters that would be classified as impaired. So they're not meeting the certain water quality standard that's been set by the state. And so basically any stream, river, lake, inland to Ohio can be listed on that. Um, but as we had mentioned earlier, or as I had mentioned earlier, there had never been a designation for the open waters of the Western Basin for um, recreation. And so basically what, what was being asked of Ohio EPA through the federal EPA is to find a criteria to be able to find the number that would say if you're above this, you're going to be impaired, and if you're below this, you're unimpaired. And so that's what that impairment designation means. Now, I want to stress, just like we do with the forecast, when you say it's going to be a six bloom, that says the bloom's going to be there of a certain size, but it doesn't mean the lake is off limit. An impairment designation on a recreation standpoint for the lake does not mean the lake is off limit. We have tools like beach guard and things that when you're just going to the beach, just like you would check the weather forecast before you go outside, look, what it's saying is that there's a standard that the EPA wants to set for the goal for that water body. And if it's not there, it's called impaired, but it does not mean that it's off limits. And so it's fun. you, you got to remember what impairment means. It just means we want to get it above a certain level. It does not mean it's off limits. And so I, I, I wanted to take the time to, to mention that. Anybody from you know, Bowling Green or Toledo that want to add to that that was on the impairment team? Yep. So what Jeff's saying is how does it tie? So we were asked by federal and, and, and Ohio EPA to make sure that this aligned with the science that was already out there, which was the Annex 4 recommendation. And so basically it was that idea of we want a reduction 40% of 28, 2008 loads. And so what we had is we went back to Rick to find if you had that reduction, what would the blooms look like? And it would be a bloom with the size of 04, correct me if I'm wrong with this, Rick, and 12. And so those two years, we went to NOAA's satellite data and basically said, okay, during um, uh, 4 and 12, how many pixels or how much area in that western basin was covered with a bloom of 20,000 cells per mil or more? And basically the data came back to say 30%. And so what we're saying is that if in a year you ever see that um, over a 30-day period, more than 30% of that lake is covered by a bloom of 20,000 20, cells per milliliters or greater, then that year is violated. So that one year, quote unquote, would be in, impaired. But as we also know, when you look at these bloom projections here, the bloom from year to year to year fluctuates because of changes in precipitation patterns and loading. So you don't want to have one year where it's over that, you impair it, and then the next year it falls, you unimpair it, and, and so on and so forth. So under Annex 4, well, what we're asking for is that one out of every nine years, we want to have a bloom that is of a certain low size. Again, 40% reduction on 2008. So the team basically got together and said, okay, a one-year violation doesn't mean impaired, but if you have, you have to have, now I'm going to forget because I'm so far away from the paper, five year, five consecutive years that are, a, that are not impaired, and then you delist. So all of those decisions using the satellite, using what a bloom should look like under an unimpaired condition, all of that was put into this process. I'm happy to say that the, that team has worked together to pull that um, recommendation that we gave to Ohio EPA into a manuscript that, that we're hoping will get published. And so 
we're hoping that Lake Erie isn't unique in, in its struggles with harmful algal blooms. And so why would another um, state or region have to reinvent the wheel on how to designate as impaired? So we're hoping that that publication results in a tool that people can use going forward. Um, another question that came from online, um, some of these I think we've answered in the context of our discussion here. Um, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, for Laura Johnson, do you track loading levels of nitrogen and is the trend comparable to phosphorus? All right. Uh, yes, we do track loading levels of nitrogen. We measure uh, nitrate nitrogen as well as what we call total Keldahl nitrogen, which is basically everything but nitrate nitrogen. So it includes all the particulates and that sort of thing. Um, for then the, the patterns in nitrogen do not necessarily match what we see with phosphorus in terms of how, uh, first of all, how nitrogen responds to a given storm event. We, for nitrate, what we tend to see is that um, we get a really big peak in concentrations, usually the first storm event after fertilizer applications, specifically side dressing for corn. Uh, this year, that peak happened in mid-June. Uh, mid it was a little bit later. Sometimes we see that closer to earlier June, but you know, corn kind of got planted late because it was cold and wet all all season. Um, so that tends to be when we see a big flush of nitrate, and then we see it come down and sort of level off to around you know, three to four milligrams per liter. Uh, overall, over time, what we've seen is that nitrate uh, average concentrations over a whole year, they peaked in about 2002 and have been coming down. They seem to be leveling off now. So we see lower overall concentrations, although that peak that happens in June has been very steady for the entire 40 years that we've been monitoring. So, you know, we've seen it go above the drinking water limit pretty consistently every June to July. It was July a couple years ago because, you know, it rained in July. So, you know, it, it varies a little bit, but there's always a big peak then. Uh, total Keldahl nitrogen does respond similarly to storms, but it hasn't changed over our period of record very drastically. Um, doesn't mean it's not important, so I'm sure that our uh, limnologists in the room would agree that, you know, for microcystis to, or yeah, microcystis to produce microcystin, they need nitrogen because it's a very nitrogen heavy compound. So we know that the availability of nitrogen in the Western Lake Erie Basin is really important. I think an extraordinarily important area of research right now is to better understand what happens to that nitrogen that comes in from the rivers. You know, is it being transformed into more usable forms since 80% of it is as nitrate? Uh, that's not what they prefer. Uh, so better understanding that is where I think that process and probably a lot of those projects are, are leaning towards. So. And, and to add to that, this is geared towards the western basin of Lake Erie, but remember two-thirds of the state drains into the Ohio River, which ultimately makes it into the Mississippi and the Gulf. Phosphorus is a limiting new primarily the limiting nutrient in freshwater systems, nitrogen is in saltwater systems. So anything we can do to control nitrogen movement off the fields or off of our cities, ultimately that's gonna make it in the Gulf and can drive the Gulf hypoxia in the Gulf dead zone and the Gulf bloom. So nitrogen is a concern and, and we have, as Laura said, we've been monitoring it through time. Well, and lucky for Ohio, we're also monitoring the three major uh, tributaries from Ohio that go into the Ohio River that would ultimately lead to the Gulf of Mexico for the sole purpose of better understanding nitrogen. So. There's another question that came in that's uh, curious about the impacts of HABs on aquatic ecology and biodiversity. Um, there are some new projects that are ramping up in this space. Um, actually, we have a researcher from Ohio State that's teaching here at the lab now and, and conducting research, uh, Dr. Susan Gray. Um, she's with the School of Environment and Natural Resources. She's actually looking at fish vision. So what she's looking at is if you put um, emerald chiners in a tank and you add sediment turbidity um, versus algal turbidity, at what point can that fish no longer see? Um, to search for prey or forage. Um, they're, this year, that was all worked on last year. This year, they're doing that for walleye. Um, so they've got tanks set over in the lab and they're looking at when the vision of walleye is in, impaired. Um, we have looked at some of the toxicity as far as are you seeing the toxin in the fish flesh? And again, the concentration suggested if you follow fish consumption advisories, you're okay. Um, but if you look at uh, Stu Ludson's lab right now, he's a researcher in the College of Arts and Sciences at OSU. He's just got a grant to look at the behavior um, um, in the physiology of fish that are found in, in blooms. And so they're really trying to figure out, is it affecting because it is a, a, a neurological toxin and it, it can have some issues in that way, that how is it affecting the behavior and the activity of, of fish? So some of that research is coming on early now 
Um, but again, if, if we show this clear link between the size of the blooms and the, and the hypoxia in the central basin, you are going to have some perhaps mortality association with the dead zone or even changes in fish behavior because of that portion of the lake that has gone without um, oxygen. Anybody in the room want to address that? Representative Sheehy. You mentioned the agronomic rate. I have a bill considering uh, uh, the application of uh, with fertilizer, the added agronomic rate for that year for that crop. Um, have, have there been any studies uh, uh, that are showing that the agronomic rate application, number one? And number two, would rain events affect the amount of the fertilizer that is down now? Okay, so the, the question was, have there been studies that, and let me make sure I'm interpreting right, that have examined the current agronomic rates to see if they're appropriate? Is that the question? Yeah, and, and, and then I guess the second question is, um, uh, should, should farmers be worried about reapplying if we get a lot of rain events after a soon application? And so it looks like I think the best option is to pass that off to Greg, because he probably knows a whole lot more about it and has a little bit more well, guys behind well, it. Let me address the agronomic rate, and then sure. maybe you want to address that follow-up question. Um, with the agronomic rate, actually, Steve Coleman, is, who is our state soil fertility specialist, is completing a three-year evaluation of the uh, fertilizer recommendations for us here in the state of Ohio. Um, those recommendations are being rolled out here in this month, uh, starting next week, in relationship to different meetings that we have with farmers across the state. So the agronomic recommendations are being updated. Um, kind of the highlight would be not a tremendous change as far as some of our critical levels in relationship to when we need to apply uh, fertilizer. I'm not sure what the outcome is on that upper end in relationship to what needs to be done from that aspect. And then I don't know if you wanted to address the application type of questions um, from a rate. I can't, I mean, for phosphorus, I would say, you know, phosphorus is sticky. Even with the bit that we see running off, um, you know, we see maybe 5 to 10 percent of what's being applied coming off for phosphorus. So most of the time, once it's applied, it's really not going to go anywhere. And, and with the current, go right ahead, with the current management, you know, uh, recommendations for fertilizer because there's a recommendation to have, you know, you know this pot of crop available phosphorus. Um, the idea behind that is that, you know, if you get to, say, a couple years down the line and you don't have enough money to buy more phosphorus, then you've banked some of it and you're still okay. You're not going to have a huge crop yield loss because of it. That could be part of the reason why we have the issues we have, but also it means that um, it, it helps protect against some of those issues. For nitrogen, I would think it is a different story, but I know that most farmers don't have the equipment to deal with reapplying nitrogen once the corn gets really tall, um, although I think they should because, goodness, that would be, I would think they get a huge benefit out of that. Greg might want to add to it. Well, and let me just go back to the phosphorus. If we limit it to a single year application, then that farmer has that application cost every year. It might be better to have them with a good placement of a two-year application rate, spending the money once to get that placed in the right fashion, and that might have less environmental impact by doing it that way. Even though the rate's a little bit higher, we get it off the surface and into the soil. I think there's some logic to that. So that single-year application from the logistics of that from an industry standpoint is a little bit concerning. But this, this clearly comes back to, again, a, a farm field is in a farm field is in a farm field, and there are some places where you're going to have to have very specialized approaches to how you apply these fertilizers. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to turn it over to Jill Gentis, and, and um, she's our, our Assistant Director for Communications. There's a website up on the screen right now. She's going to show you a resource that, that we'd like you to go to. Um, we're not going to get to all the questions that came in through the chat function, so what I will do post this event is work to answer those questions either on my own or using the experts that are in the field and we will post the answers to the rest of the questions that we weren't able to get to today. But to Jill now. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to let everyone know we had recently received a HABS Collaboratory grant to uh, develop an interactive fact sheet and videos, and uh, we just within the last day or so launched this uh, interactive fact sheet. Um, I wanted to just point you uh, to a few things. Uh, one is... Uh, 
Uh, one thing I wanted to point you to are, is we have some video, well, we'll have multiple videos. Um, one is a, a general, what is, what are harmful algal blooms that we just recently um, put up. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention are we have resources. So a lot of different resources available for uh, dealing with harmful algal blooms, as well as um, if you have questions about harmful algal blooms as you're leaving here today, we have the ability to allow you to ask those questions right here. And we will grab a expert Sorry, Tom, we need to get a little picture in for you. I like that version of Tom better. Do you like that? I, I, I do better. like that. Could you get to this point, Tom? <laughs> um, uh, but we have uh, some examples of some of the questions that uh, we've been asked with uh, our experts then ask, answering those questions. So we'll have that uh, going uh, here shortly. So if you do have questions, feel free to ask those through the um, there is also, once you're fully knowledgeable about arm boggle blooms, there is a quiz. So you can take that quiz. You will be graded. You will be graded. Yeah. There's badges. <laughs> so good. So we're, we're, we're at 1 o'clock, so I want to cut down at least to the formal um, webinar component of this. Those of you that are in the room will give you some logistics on how the rest of the afternoon is going to go. Uh, Jill, I know we had a, a high number registered. How many did we have on in real time? Do you know where we're at? Um, Okay, so in the yeah, 250 range. Okay, 250, 260. So everybody on, online, thank you for joining us. We're going to shut down now. Um, if you have any questions, again, use this uh, interactive fact sheet. Those that came through the chat function, we'll be working on those over the next week to get you some answers to those questions. Uh, Jeff, do you have any? Yep, so the webinar has been recorded and it will be posted. Jill, will it come to here or it will be posted tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, so at the URL behind me on the screen, so it's go.osu.edu forward slash tab forecast 2018, all one word. So it's go.osu.edu forward slash tabs forecast 2018, one word. So thanks everybody online and uh, have a great day.